टेन नाइन एट सेवन सिक्स फाइव फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's terrific again to have you all here to share some of our thoughts and listen to your questions about big ideas in trauma care. This is an educational initiative by the Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association and the Asia Pacific Trauma Society. I am Marinas Papiris. I'm the president of the Asia Pacific Trauma Society. And the chair of the AO Asia Pacific Trauma Community Development, and an AO trustee from the AO Foundation, we have a, a wealth of knowledge here in this room. We have a number of speakers that are world renowned in their own fields, and I'd like to welcome them and introduce them one by one. Firstly, we have Dennis Yi. He is from the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology. At the Queen Mary Hospital at the University of Hong Kong, and he is a regional faculty for the AO. We have my good friend Professor Vivek Trika, is the professor of of orthopedic surgery at the All India Institute of Medical Science, and at the JPN Apex Trauma Center. He's a consultant trauma surgeon and a pelvic surgeon, and a very good one as well. We have a good friend from、uh, Bogota, Rodrigo Pasantes. Who is the chairman of traumatology and general orthopedics from Bogota, Colombia? Is the past chair of AO Trauma Latin America, and is a trustee of the AO Foundation. And we have my friend Wael Taha, who is the vice president of the Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association. He is the chair elect of the International Trauma Board of AO. He is the head of the division of orthopedics at the Pr- Prince Mohammed bin. Abdulaziz Hospital, and is the、uh, past chair of the AO Trauma Educational Commission. And then we have our、uh, immediate past president, Hakan Clinic, who is the、uh, professor of orthopedics at Ankara University, Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology, and of course the, our immediate past chair and, and good mentor. We also have on the screen our second vice president of the APOA. Jamal Ashraf, and we thank him very much for all his support, kindness, and、um, diligence to making sure these initiatives work. We have two moderators that we're pleased to welcome as well. Dr. Azita Arif, she's a young hip and knee surgeon from Bandung, Indonesia, and as we all know at the APOA, she is the chair of the newsletter committee at the APOA, and she is doing a terrific job. Thank you very much, Azita. And on her way, running a few minutes late because of clinical commitments, there's Dr. Someone Dzwari Sasenda, who's a specialist orthopedic surgeon at Apollo Hospital Muscat in Oman, and she is a fellow of shoulder and knee arthroscopy and an active member of the Younger Surgeons Forum of Sikhod. So, without further ado, we'll commence the、uh, big ideas in trauma care and tibial plateau fractures, and I'd like to hand over to Azita Arif. To introduce the title of the first talk, so we can commence. Thank you all for attending. Please send through your、uh, questions, and we'll answer some of the questions at the end of each、uh, presentation, and some more at the end of all the presentations and a panel discussion. Enjoy the、uh, the webinar. Thank you, Dr. Marinis. For the next speaker is Dr. Dennis Yee. Title is Managing Community Lateral Tibial Plateau Fracture. This, Dr. Dennis. Dennis, I think you're you're on mute. Thank you for the invitation. I'm、uh, really honored to be presenting among all the real giants in、uh, of trauma in this、uh, world. So、um, I'm sharing my humble opinion about the lateral tibial plateau fracture, which is actually、uh, quite common. Okay, so I'm going to share some cases, and、uh, this will come from the anterior to the posterior part of the lateral plateau, and from the classic anterolateral to the transfibular to other options. Okay, so begin with the first case. So this is、um, more of classical fracture too. You can see the fracture window just、uh, lateral to the、uh, to tibial tuberosity, the press fragment here. So this is a high energy injury. So. 
this type of fracture usually are managed by an anterolateral approach where you do a, a, a slightly curved incision and then you see the IT band and GT you split it um, uh, uh, slightly in the middle or anterior and then you can uh, see the submeniscus approach to which one is joint. Okay. So some problem with this approach is um, this anterolateral fragment may become defascularized during the process when you remove the IT band and then remove the tip end and then you also cut the capsule. So this may cause sometimes a healing problem or increase the chance of infection. So for me, for this fracture, I would probably just attack at the fracture window instead of taking off the whole uh, Jared Supico IT band insertion. And then I would do the submenus approximately both in front and posterior to the, the IT band as a two separate window, which is usually enough. And for the tip end, I, you can actually just split instead of um, take it down and then you can do a MIPO uh, over the split, and then you push through more distally. In that way, you preserve most of the soft tissue to this uh, anterolateral fragment and keep it alive. So this is the uh, intraoperative X-ray. After reduction, you first need to support the subchondroidal with raft screw, okay. And for the split fragment, you need to buttress it. Okay, so these are the key. Okay, raft screw for the subchondroidal and then buttress with a plate. So then the bone is trapped here, it cannot go anywhere. Rough, this is a, this is a rough. We used to put in very big screw, like 6.5 uh, millimeter screws. Uh, Biomechanical study has shown that actually 3.5 screw, if you put in uh, more like four, this has a better biomechanical advantage than the 6.5 big screw. So that's what we usually do uh, in our practice. So that's for the first case, okay. Second case, so this looks similar, okay. Uh, just a split depression. But if you look carefully, okay, that is actually something strange, mainly that wheel. This fragment is more posterior. So usually the posterior border of the femoral condyle is uh, more or less aligned with the posterior border of lateral tibial plateau. So this patient, this is something more displaced posteriorly. If you look at CT, this one, uh, the epicenter is not at the anterolateral fragment, but rather it's at the proximal tibial, proximal tibial fibular joint and the posterior rim is exposed posterior. So this is where the um, main fracture is happening. So surgeon did it with a classic anterolateral approach and then just buttress a posterior medial uh, plate. Something very similar to the first case. Are you satisfied with this reduction? So look carefully. There is actually a discrepancy between the lateral border of the femur and the lateral border of the tibia. Same on the lateral wheel, that this is not completely reduced. You give it enough time, you will note that there is a decrease in lateral joint space over time because the joint is subluxed over the lateral side. The medial side is congruent, the lateral side is not congruent. Fortunately, this is the lateral side, so it's more forgiving usually. The patient can still walk at 30 minutes, but there is a lateral OA, so this is not uh, the best. This is a problem classic approach. So you attack from anterior. It's very difficult to see the posterior part. So you see, this is the CT after the, um, that uh, fixation. The post rim is still un unreduced. So this is more of a fixation in the wrong position. And the proximal tip joint is also not reduced. So the fragment is here and same, you see. This is where the um, expulsion of fracture occurred and this is where the post rim goes. So you need to address this intraoperatively. The problem with antelet approach is it will is blocked by the fibula, the LCL, the, the biceps, and the peroneal nerve is in the way. So it's not easy. But we just look at this uh, example. So this was, is a bad example. And quite similar case, postlateral fragment. If you look at this axial cut, the axial cut is the most important. Think more, okay? Not just the free column. You can actually look at the anterolateral, postlateral around the PTFJ, and then the um, somewhere more medial, okay? So in this patient, the uh, focus is all around the uh, proximal tibial joint also. So you may consider other approach other than classic anterolateral. We put the patient in a floppy position uh, uh, pro as proposed by Professor Lowe. In here, you can actually kill the patient intraoperatively to go to the medial side if, if necessary. We, this is the lateral position and um, this is the peroneal nerve, this is lateral side. This is where the fibula osteotomy occurs. So the fibula head is flipped up. This is the knee joint. 
This is a tibialis anterior. And we put a distractor to uh, open up the lateral side. This uh, retractor is holding the tibialis anterior. And you can attack and visualize the postlateral fragment uh, very clearly, and you can instrument there. So it's easy to do. You can buttress the postlateral corner, buttress the lateral side, and then reduce it well. The fibula osteotomy is fixed but with 3.5 screw. So this is a post op X-ray, which shows the, um, it, the alignment over the posterior aspect and the lateral aspect. So this is reduced, okay? And it is buttressed. The patient had good range of motion and pain-free at one year post-op. The classic Shasker AO classification is more based on X-ray. So it does not take into axial wheel. So it is uh, more of an AT wheel, one, two, three. There's a, this lacks the differentiation between anterior and posterior and it's not uh, satisfactory. Now we have CT, so we know better. So we know there is an anterolateral, postlateral, and this would dictate where, which approach you want to use. The AO classification, you have qualification, which you can notice is AL, TL, AM, TM, and this will help you immensely. So just take another example. This is a postlateral corner. It is depressed mostly at the back. The usual postlateral um, fracture it is more a flexion of bulbous injury. And this is the most depressed area where you want to reach really it up here. And then you want to look at the central part to compare it and you want to instrument here. The fibula head is in your way. So if you do a fibula osteotomy and then you open up also postlateral capsule. Actually, you are poking open the joint and then you can see very clearly, okay? And also work, and also you have open reduce a little bit. So this is the uh, clinical photo. This is the fibula um, osteotomy. Uh, this is the osteotomy site, and this is the postolateral corner, okay? This is peroneal, per, a popliteal tendon is in the back. You see there's a natural space open up where you can really see around two to three centimeter inside the joint, and that is enough for you to reduce everything well. So this is post-op x-ray. You can see we, we, we roughed the most posterior part of the lateral tibial plateau. We fixed it, the fibula osteotomy with the um, tension band wiring. CT post-op compared to CT pre-op, the joint is reduced. And one year post-op, there is no OA change and the patient had good range of motion. Another uh, patient, a little bit similar, but not completely the same. Okay, so this one seems to enter lateral is the more displaced one. The postlateral fragment is relatively less displaced, but you see there is a metaphysical spike which is uh, slightly displaced. And you look at the 3D reconstruction, the postlateral fragment is not too displaced. The anterolateral fragment is displaced. So for this case, maybe we don't need to do a fibrosotomy, but we need to support the postlateral fragment. Otherwise, it, it may go um, displaced after, after uh, of the operation. So we sent out the incision around the fibula head and split the IT band. And then we develop space between the LCL, which is this, this is LCL, and the lateral tibial plateau. So this is a power LCL space. Until you can put a Holman to hook around the postlateral plateau. And you can see the fracture line that separates the anterolateral fragment and the postlateral fragment. So this is again the anatomy. This is the peroneal nerve, LCL, biceps. And then this is a lateral tibial plateau. You can put your finger there to feel the spine, but you cannot uh, see. Okay, but that's enough already. And then you, and then you can joystick to reduce it, and then you just pin it. So that's that's a simple way. Okay, you don't need to dissect too much. You just feel. For fixation, we had uh, this is an idea from Professor JKO, which is my mentor, and he, he used a rim plate of uh, V8 2.7 plates and then hook it around the postlateral corner. And this is um, from some of his publications. So you can develop space between the LCL and the lateral tibial plateau, the, par the peri LCL space. And you can put your plate around there like this. Uh, one minute left. Okay. So this is a 3D print um, preoperative. We need to plan, uh, plan and bend the plates. Otherwise, it's not easy to bend intraoperatively. So you see it hooks around the posterior corner, it just buttress everything well. post op X-rays and function are well. This is not an easy area because of all this difficult. 
uh, of, of these obstacles. Okay. So for the autonomy to care of this part, you can flip it around. If you do a uh, JKO's technique, you can look around here. If you want somewhere more posterior, you need other uh, approach, such as the posterior approach by Frost, where you go between lateral gastro and the peroneal nerve. So postal medial takes you to around the midline, and remaining, you need a separate postal lateral approach. It's not that common you need to use. It's uh, quite aware, actually. But sometimes you need. The problem is you need to be careful of the anterior tibial artery and vein, which is around 4 to 5 cm below joint line. This is not an extensive approach. Okay. So this are a series of postural approach on osteotomy and not on osteotomy. You can see, I mean, in general, the outcome are good. Okay, there are some limitations of each approach. So you need to tell it to what uh, you have. Okay, some summary. Okay, so you need to have uh, different armamentarium, classic end to approach if you have somewhere here, fibular osteotomy if you have somewhere here, and if you're more posterior, you may need a rim plate or post approach. So these are different um, options. Take home message, okay. So you need to know fibular osteotomy and other approach. You need to contain the rim. You need to support it with rough screw. If you're doing antelector approach, better to preserve the blood supply. Otherwise, there may be increased risk of infection. The nerve needs to be seen if you're going post and you don't want something like this. If you're put, putting your plate in strange place, such as a post level corner, okay, be sure to do it well. Otherwise, in the future, the joint surgeon is going to be mad when they want to take it off. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Dennis. So um, we have questions here. <clears throat> From Dr. Jama, what is the acceptable depression for lateral fragment and why it is more than that on the medial side? You mean uh, why the lateral plateau has more depression fraction than the medial side, right? Yeah, what, what is the acceptable depression for lateral fragment? So um, I think medial side is more, uh, usually there's a split fracture. Um, depression can occur, but it's less common. Um, maybe this is uh, related to the bone quality. The bone, the medial side is usually, usually harder. So, um, I mean, you, usually you see lateral side, there is a lot of depressed cross commandant fragment, but less in the medial side. But luckily, the lateral side is uh, more forgiving. I mean, articular, even you have a little bit imperfect, then it is um, still okay. Okay. And is femoral distraction essential in all lateral condyle fracture? Uh, so the so second question is, is femoral distracted essential in all lateral corner fracture? I would say um, no, if you, especially if you do a fibular osteotomy, because that already subluxes the joint and you can over reduce with our femoral distractor. Femoral distractor actually sometimes get in your way to instrument and then you cannot rotate, uh, like it sometimes it's not that user friendly. And um, so, Question three, we have been taught that the knee should be flexed for reduction in fixation, but uh, the occasion will distract the knee's extent. So I think it depends on if it's an antolateral or postolateral. Antolateral fracture, you flex it, then it is uh, giving you more room. Postolateral fracture, you need to extend it so that uh, you have more room. If you flex, then the posterior side is always going to sunk down. So that's the antolateral and postolateral difference. The fourth question will be for buttress plate fixation, which screw should be fixed first? Um, the, the cortical, the, you should always get a cortical screw first to compress everything. If it's, you are talking about a rim plate, then you try to draw the plate anteriorly so the post lateral is buttress. If you are talking about a lateral big buttress plate, then I will fix um, a cortical screw closest to the uh, fracture site. Okay, thank you, Dennis, for a very interesting lecture, but we have to uh, proceed for another speaker. It's a Professor Fifik Trika. The title is Combined Tibial Plate and Soft Fracture, How to Manage. Please, Dr. Fifik. Okay, so can I start now? Right. Thank you. Thank you, APST. 
Hey, Asia Pacific Trauma Society for inviting me for this talk. And it's on complex tibial injuries which involve both the shaft and articular fractures, and both of them are combined here. There are no disclosures from my side. The learning objectives they include to understand the challenges which we face while we are dealing with these bifocal injuries of tibia. The initial management and evaluation, how does it differ in such cases? And also in definitive management, what are the choices that we deal with? Which are the implants? How do we approach these fractures and also fix them? And finally, we are going to analyze the various options which we have for managing this complex fracture through some cases. So let's first understand what is a combined articular and a sharp fracture of proximal tibia. It's quite an unusual combination injury. Besides the articular damage, there has to be a diaphyseal injury as well. And that's why it's mostly a very high energy mechanism which is involved here. In fact, if we look at it, and even in us, when we are going through our cases, we found that they have been associated with a lot of other skeletal injuries which are there, especially floating knees, which are so common, along with open injuries, sometimes polytrauma and other organ injuries as well. Nearly 60 to 70 percent of cases have some other injuries also associated with these parts. And the furthermore to complicate is that there are very few treatment guidelines which are available in literature if we really look at it, with not many big papers because it's a rare injury. If you look at the literature, this is the one big paper which was there by Sean Northbrook from US and David Beray, which showed that in out of the 10 years follow-up, they had nearly 3% of cases which were there, which were mostly uh, 50 cases of the 1,500-odd cases which they had found of non-contiguous fractures. And as I said, 71% had other injuries and the fixation which they did was mostly with a nail plate construct. If you look at the literature, the other literature is only on a Purdue. There's one review article in 2018, which has shown that these are the fractures which needs different sort of managements than the regular proximal tibia fractures. So what do we do when we evaluate such cases? We need to look at the personality. We need to look whether it's an open or a closed fracture. Other concomitant injuries, that's very important to look at. The damage to the soft tissues, that's the bane for all the proximal tibia and distal tibia fractures. And they are quite so common in these high energy injuries. Looking at both the articular and the diaphyseal fragment displacement is going to decide how we are going to approach these fractures and also the quality of the stock or the bone is going to involve which sort of fixation we are going to do. So in all, we need to look at the soft tissues, the articular displacement, how big is the articular displacement, where is the diaphyseal extent, and analyze the fracture pattern so that we can do our fixation in the best possible manner. How do we plan these cases? The first thing to do in such cases is a CT scan. I'll show you one of these cases. This is a case which has a fracture of the articular damage and condyle as well as a shaft of the tibia. You can see there is an intact area between the two fracture segments. Hence, this is a non-contiguous fracture pattern that the two fractures are separate, the diaphyseal and the articular one. Whereas if you look at this sort of a fracture, which is more of a type six and more beyond that, the two articular as well as the diaphyseal fracture patterns are extending into each other and there is no unique intact bone between them. And that's what I am calling them as contiguous fracture patterns, which involve a tibial condyle fractures, which are exiting into the shaft and hence, there are a different fracture patterns. How do we fix them? Articular fractures should be anatomically fixed with absolute stability. But more important here is to maintain the mechanical alignment and axis because tibial condyle and lower limb weight bearing, the mechanical axis is so very important here. And possibly to have the best fixations for both the fracture patterns. We can have single or the plate fixations for these fractures or we can have some intramedullary fixations 
along with a combined nail plate combinations which are there for these combination complex injuries so let's de deal with them case by case and then evolve our treatment method and principle for such cases so this is one of the cases of a 34 year old man and you can see that the articular fracture along with the exiting into the diaphysis is the fracture pattern and that is having a lot of segmental medial fracture is there so because of the soft tissues and the widening of the condyles we had to put in a fixator for distraction as well as for the reduction of the swellings and then we had to do the ct scan which showed us a displaced articular of the lateral condyle a segmental part of the medial condyle with the column going into the shaft and with the depression of the posterior side so in such cases this is a contiguous pattern where both the articular and the shaft are in one plane and hence you need to the reduction of one is going to influence the other fracture as well how do we maintain the alignment in such cases becomes difficult because there is no set landmark by which we can do that and hence in such cases we felt that the dual plating or plating from both the sides reducing the articular fractures properly and then maintaining the alignment are going to give us good results with the medial plate first and that's what we were able to do a long four or five plate on the lateral aspect and an equally long medial plate because you need to strut both the columns of both the sides together the limb alignment and the is required the articular reduction and the limb alignment correction are both of them are linked and usually as i said long plates are used this is his follow up after 3 and 1/2 months another case in fact he became covid positive when we had to check he was a poly traumatized patient and we had to put him on a fixator for a damage control and then get his cts which was again a contiguous sort of a fracture pattern and which was fixed with a dual plating mechanisms with this sort of a long lateral plate and a medial also fixation of the columns there sometimes these fractures have come to us with two e days later with a fish shot me or an open wound because of the soft tissue problems and this is how we came to us in our from a remote area you can see the fracture of the articular exiting into the shaft again a contiguous sort of a fracture pattern we need to put in a fixator we had to put in a negative pressure therapy we tried to put in the articular cartridge and get them in compression we couldn't get the best results of the articular reduction but the alignment we were able to get somewhat okay and we closed the wound on the medial side because we were afraid of the infection so we put in a one long plate and that's what his follow up at 6 weeks just now you can see the amount the wound has healed properly the result of the range of motion is good the alignment is good not the articular reduction because of his age as well as the combination which he suffered so for contiguous bifocal injuries the reduction of articular and mechanical axis are interdependent so you need to correct the articular as well as the axis with, with your own reduction of one is going to have the effect dual plates from both the sides in a minimally invasive way by sliding is most important in such cases but it also depends on the intra articular reduction and the involvement how you are going to use an intra medullary fixation for such cases as i have shown you soft tissue insult is a big problem and a quite a challenging one So now we look at the other sort of a fracture pattern. Look at this. This is having an articular fracture depression. You can see on the enlarged viewpoint, and you have a segmental diaphyseal fracture here. That's non-contiguous. Why? Because you can see that the articular fracture is separate from the diaphysis. There is an intact bone in between, and hence both of them are two separate fracture pattern entities, which may be tackled in a separate manner. so that's what we tried to do here the articular depression we tried to reduce by making a medial window lifting it up and then with this sort of a correction we put in the bone substitute from the same tunnel which we had drilled and then put in some raft screws unfortunately we tightened it somewhat more so you can see that the condyle has slightly gone that way but most of these fractures raft screws were on the posterior aspect where that articular depression was and then subsequently we have done and gone in for the diaphyseal fracture 
to do a nailing for that, which is the ideal treatment for a segmental tibial fracture through a suprapatellar nailing. And hence, we have been able to make sure that the entry point is anterior, the screws are posterior, and this complex injury could be treated by the best treatment for both the fracture patterns, two different incisions by suprapatellar nail and the wrap screws for such cases. And this is what his immediate post-op, the axis and the alignment looks okay. And the follow-up, it shows the union and excellent range of motion out here. So in non-contiguous fracture, which are bifocal injuries, as we see here, the reduction of articular cartilage or the reduction does not depend on the diaphyseal component. Both of them are separates and we can choose our modality as per the individual fracture pattern. Intramedullary nailing helps us to manage the soft tissues in a better way and gets a stable fixation for both these fracture patterns. Another case, you can see the depression. CT scan helps us to see the articular cartilage and how the combination is there and then a segment and then a diaphyseal lower down fracture along with the femur fracture which was fixed but the soft tissues are the crucial ones. And I'll again repeat, high energy soft tissue injuries. These are complex injuries. We know to understand the soft tissues and what we did with the fixator. And then we saw the soft tissues evolve. And slowly after around 15 to 20 days only, the planning was that we will again do a nail plate for such cases, getting the best reduction for the articular area and the ideal fixation for the diaphyseal as well. And that's what we try to do. We need to look at the nail entry point, which is going to give us the most important crucial area. And we put in an infrapatellar nail here, lower down from the entry because the fracture was very high up. And that's what we were able to do. A plate on the lateral aspect, holding those two fractures of the lateral side, and then an infrapatellar nail going lower down, which is holding the shaft fracture to the best. This is after his two months six months follow-up and his good union was there. Another case, diaphyseal fracture with an articular damage. You can see it's on the lateral aspect. Both you can see in the coronal and the sagittal sections, which is central and posterior area. And again, the same principle has been used here, lifting up the articular cartilage, holding it with a plate, when the plate we put in, it's a temporizing manner. We put it posteriorly, and then we put in a suprapatellar nailing because the medial entry point for the nail is okay. The plate is posterior to the nail, and then subsequently, you are able to get this sort of a nail plate construct, which gives us good results for this complex injuries. This is the minimal soft tissues that you raise, and the soft tissues are preserved in such cases post-op x-ray, six weeks follow-up with good functional results here. So for a nail plate construct, non-contiguous fractures are taken. What we need to ensure is the nail entry point and the reaming does not affect the articular reduction. The plate or the screws hold the articular reduction adequately and the diaphyseal fracture by the nail part. Alignment is very easy in such cases. This is another case where you can see that the medial condyle is damaged. Now this time, again, no issues. You can go in in a non-contiguous factor, hold the medial plate on the medial side, and then again go in for an entry point of the suprapatellar, a nail entry point is okay, and fix it with the lateral part also, which was subsequently ligaments were taken care of. That's his follow-up. So I would say that the surgical tips for a nail plate construct Analyze the CT scan properly where you want to put in your screws first for the articular cartilage and the fracture fragment. Reduction of the articular area is done first. Provisionally, you fix with screws or K wires and then ensure that your plate and screws are posterior to the entry point of the nail which you have going to insert. And the nail insertion and reaming should not affect the articular reduction plate is subsequently held with, held with more screws. So finally, since not much literature is available on this complex injury, I have come out with this all algorithm for the benefit that a contiguous pattern where the articular and the diaphyseal are same, look at the articular fracture pattern, extent of the diaphyseal region and the soft tissue conditions. And since both are interlinked, 
the, in the reduction part, dual long plates are going to give us good results with alignment if they are, but the alignment sometimes are problem. Nail plate can also be used. When the two fracture fragments are a separate entity, non-contiguous way, you use two fractures, make sure that the articular reduction is done as accurately as possible. The entry point is the area where you need to decide whether you can do a nail plate construct in such cases after looking at the soft tissues. Remember that the plate has to be put posterior to the nail and the articular reduction is the primal mechanism by which you can get good results. Mm -hmm. Take home, evaluate other concomitant injuries. This is a complex injury, a high mm -hmm. severity injury. Most of the cases which I have shown had some polytrauma issues multiple skeletal injuries or soft tissue damage. A CT evaluation is a must. Maybe a fixator used to be, can be put. You need to span, scan and plan principle in some of these cases. Articular reduction and mechanical alignment are equally important in this complex bifocal injuries of proximal tibia and the shaft. Dual plates in a minimally invasive manner or a nail plate construct, which is the latest way by which doing this has made functional results good. Addition of suprapatellar or an extended, semi extended nailing helps us to take an advantage by making our incision higher up so that we can take the articular fixation in a much better way. And remember that nail plate construct for such a complex and high severity injury looks like an attractive option right now. I thank you for your hearing. So I guess the moderator has to... Uh, Uh, thank you, Dr. Vivek Trika, sir, uh, for uh, providing us in nutshell the treatment plan and the challenges of fixing uh, combined TBL plateau on shaft fractures. I have one question for you, sir. Uh, uh, sir, uh, what is the role of CT? Like, uh, when do we uh, take a CT scan uh, for this complex fractures? Uh, should we take it before, uh, like, spanning with the fixator or... Uh, at the time of uh, initial injury. Okay, so CT scan nowadays, I feel that they are more very important for all the intraarticular fractures, especially so for the tibial fractures, which are involving the condyles. In fact, if you see the latest classifications which have come, they are all based on CT scans, the axial sections, and they are dealing with more of the posterior and the fragment-specific, column-specific fixation methods. So for such all proximal tibia, we do get a CT scan, but for such a complex matter, because we may not be able to, because the deformities and the displacements in such fractures, the two bifocal fractures will be high. So to proper evaluation of the condyles and which mechanic option you are going to choose as a fixation modality becomes very crucial. And CT is a must in such cases. Now, when to do that CT? It depends when, if you are going to have a lot of overlap, a lot of displacement, and because of bifocal nature, the shaft as well as the proximal part is in a deformed position, I would say that to get it in a fixator and then getting a CT scan is the better method. But not all cases of these bifocal injuries will have such fractures. So you may not use the external fixator in all cases. In the contiguous fracture patterns, which are involving the same fracture, I think distraction is helpful. And those are the ones where I get a CT after getting the distractor put or a fixator put. For the isolated tibial fractures and the diaphyseal fractures, I think you may not require a fixator that much and you can get a CT whenever you want them, as soon as, if possible, when the traction has been maintained. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I have one more question for you, sir. Uh, with regarding uh, suprapatellar nailing, so when we fix the articular fragment, uh, do you recommend uh, reaming of the proximal fragment, sir? Yeah, so or, it depends. Uh, 
to pass the nail uh, directly uh, i'm dreaming only the medullary canal okay so as we know a suprapatellar nailing has added one more advantage and a plus point for us for such complex cases the benefit of suprapatellar nailing is that we do it in supine position we are able to take one plane deformities which gets negated and by just giving traction it helps us imaging becomes easy and also the entry point is easier which is extra articular at the tip of the condyles now once you evaluate your ct properly you need to see where that fracture of the articular cartilage and the condyle is exiting is it involving the entry point area or not and whether by just putting in a clamp and compressing it you will be able to make both the condyles together into one tibial plateau if the articular depression is right there in the central anterior portion maybe the nail may not be the right way the suprapatellar way and then you might have to go slightly infra and take a lower down entry point near the tibial tuberosity and put in the nail if you really want to however i might put in two plates or different mechanisms and fixations for such cases with the suprapatellar we normally go extra articular fix the posterior articular condyles with screws or with k wires and then we ream it as ensuring that the entry point and the reaming is not affecting and distracting our fracture reduction of the articular cartilage just like in proximal femur that the nail should not go to the fracture and cause wedge effect thank you sir uh, i think i've answered my question uh, i have one more question for you sir uh, in case uh, if you are putting a screw from lateral plate uh, to fix the medial fragment uh, should this butterfly fragment be fixed or left as it is so uh, is the screw from the lateral side is self sufficient or uh, you need to plate it from the medial side are we talking of a bicondylar fracture or Uh, if you are talking of that that's going to be subsequently yes, covered sir. it's going to be subsequently covered in the next talk i think or maybe I, dr khan is going to cover vivek, that vivek i think the question is because in one of your presentations you there was a medial butterfly fragment which you was fixed by two screws okay, from so the those, lateral plate yeah so it's is is the two screws are going into the nail out there it seems there were the nail and the nail screws were there they were not fixing the lag or the butterflies i won't be fixing them they can act as a lag screw it was looking like that but they were the screws which were going in the nail with wrap screws they were the interlocking bolts for the nails which were there not the lag they are not required in that sense for the butterfly holding it because nail provides you the ligament to taxis and holds those butterflies together they were the interlocking for the nail that we had been using yes sir Thank you, sir. Thank you. Over to Marine is for the third talk. Ah, oh, yes, and I just like uh, I just like to introduce uh, Rodrigo Pasantes, and he'll uh, talk to us about complex type four Shadska fractures, tips and tricks for everyone. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Marine, is for the kind invitation. It's a pleasure to be with you guys, and I'm going to talk to you about the complex type four Shadska fractures tips and tricks. Okay, so a lot of you have seen these injuries, and as you see here, and as Shaskar used to say, these are fractured dislocations. This is not simple fractures. Um, Dennis mentioned a, a few moments ago that if you take a look at the lateral condyle and you see where the of, from the femur, and then you see where the lateral condyle of the of the tibia, it's completely dislocated. And if you see the fracture goes all the way to the medial condyle. So these are as more call in 1981 fracture dislocations of the knee especially if you take a look you could see that the type 2 could be a lateral or a medial one these ones are the medial ones and in 2007 Walkis suggested a new classification which as you see from uh, left to right on the left side the fracture exits just in the articular surface of the medial plateau in the middle the type b you see that the fracture go in between the spines and in the type c you could see here 
basically the fracture goes all the way to the lateral plateau and these ones are the more complex ones and in this article uh Walk is mentioned that the compartment syndrome goes higher once you go from a to c i recommend to you to go and look at this fracture from china in uh, orthopedics in 2014 where they use now uh, the ct scan to get into this classification and this basically divided in two the group one is a classic medial plateau fractures and the group two is the medial plateau fracture with the lateral plateau extension and you see here on this uh, on this fracture that you see that the subtype could be an anterior medial quadrant a posterior medial quadrant a posterior a partial medial plateau with the sagittal fracture which is a type a the total medial condyle fracture which is a type b that go between the spines and the medial plateau comminuted and you could see that they talk about the fracture line location the fracture orientation and the fracture type and you could see there are different fracture types and orientations in the simple ones but in the complex ones you could see that it could be the total medial condyle fracture with partial lateral plateau split the type c from walkis the total subtotal medial condyle fracture with posterior lateral quadrant depression and the posterior medial plateau fracture with posterior lateral quadrant depression and you see that the fracture line orientation in these ones are from the sagittal obliques and coronal planes and the types of fractures that they have are different ones <coughs> so what is what about the soft tissue injury prevalence and if you take a look at the three types from walkids and in this article by by young they look at this and they look at one type of fractures in type <clears throat> a 6 in type b and 20 in type c and what they found was that the collateral ligaments were injured in 63% of the cases but only 11% of those are avulsions that needed some treatment the mcl injured 29% of the cases and they treated most of them non operatively the cruciate ligaments 92.6% of the fractures presented and they look at all these injuries on the MRI but only 7% were avulsion fractures that needed to be treated at the same time of the tibial plateau injuries the PCL was 70.4% but most of them were incomplete injuries and the meniscus were medial 44.4% and lateral 63% most of them this insertion from the capsule not a complete injury of the meniscus and you could you could say that from this study we learned that this type of injuries are fractured dislocations and the reason we take an mri for this is to see at these injuries the soft tissue injuries so let's go back to the case this is a 27 year old guy who was sustained a motor vehicle accident he was driving his motorbike and he was hit by a car and sustained this fractured dislocation and you could see on the animation on the left hand side how the fracture goes all the way to the lateral plateau with some impaction in the central part on the spines so here you could see that basically is the medial plateau and the and the and the femur that is displaced medially and the lateral tibia dislocates towards the lateral side so this is how you could see from the front from the back and from the superior part where the fracture line is and here what you need to do is basically push the medial plateau towards the lateral plateau like you said like where i'm going to put my thumb right there and push it and you could do this with this technique described by Paul Tornera in 2016 using a, a periarticular clamp that you can put on the medial condyle and on the lateral condyle in the femur and once you close this you can reduce it that way as you could see here reduce the fracture and this is fracture patterns are very difficult to reduce so this is a tip and trick that you could use to do this <clears throat> then is mentioned uh, the difficulty is how to get to this ones and i'm going to show you different techniques from different authors and then i'm going to show you the case what i did So Marcus Shedini and Stephen Sims when they found these fractures what you have impaction like this one on the lateral side what they suggested is converting a type 4 into a type 6 doing a 
osteotomy on the lateral side. And these are pictures taken from the article when they did the osteotomy where the dashed line is, and you could see where the arrows pointed all the impaction on the medial side in the central part and how you can elevate this and reduce them. And once you reduce them, you fix it like a bicondylar tibial plateau. This is the proposal that Christoph Sommer and Yves Acklin to, a, to an extended medial approach in posterior medial fracture dislocation. So here's a case from Christoph that you could see it goes all the way to the medial side of type C, but some impaction on the lateral side, as you could see right there. And then what he says is come from the medial side and then respect the pes anserinus and then work from the posterior medial side, and you could see all the fracture line. And as that is mentioned, you could see at the CT scan that you choose the window that you're going to work through. And the, here is Christoph putting a, a spreader in between the fracture lines, opening the fracture side, and getting with the elevator to elevate the lateral side, as you see right there. And you see how the, the lateral side the impaction is reduced from the medial side, and then you see there a buttress plate from the posterior medial corner. And Christoph suggested also that you could get, once you come from, let me go back from this, you could go to the anterior part and go parapatellar and get a small incision that you can suture back the meniscus, or, uh, I'm sorry, the ACL in case it is disrupted. So what are the goals of treatment on medial in complex medial plateau? One, you have to respect the soft tissues because that will take you to the approaches and timing of you doing this. You have to restore the anatomy of the articular surfaces, especially when there is comminution in the central and lateral part. You have to give an stable fixation to the fracture fragment that includes the tibial spine and correct the axis, length, and rotation. And at last but not least, you have to repair the meniscus and or the ligament injuries as far as they are necessary and possible. So this is the guy, as you could see there. This is the injury. So the day number one, we put an X-fix on it. And I want to point it out that I put the X marks where my pins are going to be. I draw the patella and I draw what I think on day one, what is my future incision. So you could see I draw a line in the central part and I draw what I thought at that point could be my incision on the medial side. And I try to avoid this for the future uh, surgery. So here you see the X-fix at the end. You could see here the CT scan with the impaction centrally and posteriorly on this one. You could see there that the central part is the central and posterior is completely comminuted. The medial side is respected. So this is a type C injury. You could see there is central and posterior, and you could see there on the 3D reconstruction that mainly the condyles are okay, but the central lateral and posterior is completely comminuted. So this is the X-rays of the after the uh, spanning X fix. So what the reduction? You need to reduce the posterior lateral depression. You need to fix the posterior medial buttress, reduce and fix the tibial spines and the ACL. So what I did after studying the CT scan, I decided to use this approach described by uh, Espinosa and Alan Jones and Adam Starr from Dallas, where they use a midline and third incision for isolated medial plateau fractures. And what they do is a central scale incision coming from the lateral side and then dislocate the patella so you can see the whole joint and expose it that way so you can treat also the um, ACL and fix this. So this is from now on, on your left-hand side is the head and on the right-hand side is the foot of this patient. So this is the patient the day we did the surgery. This is the approach, as you could see there. And here we're looking uh, at the injury with an spreader on the distal part. You could see there, this is another picture. We open the fracture side we elevate the postal lateral part, and now we K-wire with uh, shunt spins, we manipulate the fragments, reduce under direct vision with a pointer reduction clamp, and then you could see basically just the anterior part, and these small cell retractors are holding the ACL right there. 
And here you see at the end how with tunnels, we repair the ACL, as you see right there. And with tunnels, we put it back and the spines in place. And this is the immediate postoperative exercise with a medial plate and some rafting screws from the lateral side. And you could see, as Dennis mentioned, these two rafting screws are very posterior to hold the impaction in the, in the central part, posterior lateral, and you could see the spines have been attached with sutures. This is the follow-up. And this is one year follow-up. And this is the range of motion. And I was lucky to see him uh, just eight years later, this is this function. Unfortunately, didn't get some x-rays at that time, but this is the function of this person. So in summary, what I told you is that you need to choose a one approach, either medial anterior to do a reduction of the posterior lateral impaction, to put a medial buttress place, and to reduce and fix the ACL and restore all the uh, these complex injuries. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Rodrigo. That was a, a, a very um, informative and uh, interesting talk. Um, while, while the audience is thinking about their questions, could you give them um, some tips or tricks as to how you manage the meniscus with these um, medial tibial plateau fractures and these posterior medial tibial fractures? Yes, Maureen, is what we do usually is uh, there are no injuries on the meniscus itself. There are basically a vault from the, from the other side. So basically what we do is put sutures, the same thing as Dennis showed on his lecture. You remember the picture with the three sutures on this one and then attach it either to the plate if we uh, have the, the holes in the plate or we use suture anchors that we put some anchors on the, on the medial side on the plateau, Marinis. And uh, another question for you, Rodrigo, for the comminuted posteromedial fractures, where, mm -hmm. you know, and I understand why Christoph <coughs> would want to protect the medial hamstrings, but if you're going to double plate that medial side, do you sometimes have to incise those hamstrings to achieve that? Yes, yes, Marini, definitely. And, you know, I said it's a funny discussion with my colleagues from the sports medicine side because every time I do that, they say, you know, you did this with the... With the with these tendons, and I said, come on, give me a break. You take them off to reconstruct the ACL. I just cut it, put my plates, and then suture it back. That's what I do, Marinis. But if, if they are in the way, I try to respect it most of the time, but if they are in my way, as you mentioned, and I do not hesitate because I need to put the plates in the, in the, in the right place to buttress the postural medial uh, fragments. And how about the vascular status, Rodrigo? What do you do about assessing the the vascular status. There's always a concern, obviously, with uh, medial tibial plateau fractures, especially if they're a proxy for a tibial, for a knee joint dislocation, that there may be an, a, an intimal injury to the artery. Co correct, Marinis. We take the uh, ankle brachial index, and if we have any doubt, we uh, do a CT angel. Very good. Hey, Rodrigo, one of the, um, inter it's interesting you quoted that paper with the anterior incision because on yep. the whole, and, and I'd like to stress for everyone, it was for isolated medial tibial fracture that, you know, they used the isolated um, incision and then dissected around to the back. What would have happened if you were having difficulties uh, reducing the lateral uh, depression? What, what would you have, be what would have been your plan B for that particular case? Marinis, and if you look at the uh, the X-rays, the interesting part, as you mentioned, is that the lateral part is attached to the tibial shaft. So basically, right. it's one big piece. So it's easier to reduce if you manipulate the, the tibial side. And and the the most important thing, Marinis, is the difficulty to me is try to get back the medial side towards the lateral side, uh, and that's where I use the. Um, the tip that I show you from uh, Paul Torneta using the periarticular clamp. But the plan B, usually Marinis is trying to have some joysticks, uh, the femoral distractor. I'm a huge fan of the femoral distractor, and I try to use it uh, whenever I'm in trouble. Yeah, and I think that's a good point for the audience because they may not have picked up that that fragment was attached to the medial side. If it's a, a fairly significant depression, would that alter the way that you would approach that particular fracture? Uh, maybe, 
maybe and as, uh, that's why I show you the other uh, surgical approaches, including converting this type four into a type six, doing an osteotomy on the lateral side, and then you tackle it in a different way. You don't do a central approach; you do a dual approach, one on the medial side and one on the lateral side. And once you do the ones on the lateral side, you do an osteotomy uh, to see the impaction on the lateral side and do the same thing as as Dennis said. And what do you do in the post-op mobilization, Rodrigo? You know, if they've had a posteromedial reduction, a meniscal repair and anterior cruciate ligament repair, how how do you mobilize these patients? Uh, Marvin is, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit crazy, so, but I let them move as soon as possible, range of motion full, and I'd let them put wide varying as tolerated. Uh, um, we have been thought long time that we need to protect them for at least six to 12 weeks, uh, no wide varying, but I'm usually let them put weight bearing as tolerated if I trust my fixation. And believe me, I do my best to have the best fixation in the world to let this patient walk. I don't know the patients around Asia, but our Colombian patients have a little bit uh, they don't pay attention to what we said. They like to break the rules. Look, I, I don't think you're crazy at all, and we all have trouble sometimes trusting the patient with our uh, instructions. Uh, and I think the key factor is the range of motion, right? So, you know, if you're not sure about your fixation, you can partially wait for them for a while. But I think if you're repairing the soft tissues, early range of motion is, is the key factor. I, I would agree with you. And what do you do? Uh, one more tip from you, R- Rodrigo. If you, if you are having troubles, particularly with a posteromedial tibial plateau fracture, if you are having trouble reducing it up the hill to try and get it fully reduced at the front, do you have any tips and tricks as to what the, uh, the blocks to reduction may be? Uh, yeah, my baby. If, uh, if I see that the fracture is mainly posteromedial, I'd like to put these patients prone and do a posterior medial approach because I think putting the patient prone with the leg in extension, as Jamal mentioned, it will help you to reduce the fracture by gravity. So that's one of the things that I I try to do uh, because it's easier to to reduce them in extension than in flexion. But to fix it, you need to do a little bit of flexion, but it's easier to do it in extension. So that's why I do that. Yeah, I agree. There's, there's occasionally I get, uh, it challenges me if the anterior cruciate ligament in the spine is blocking the reduction. So I, I just need to be mindful of that. But, but I agree. I think the laminar spreader and the clamps and, and walking it up the hill is the way to go. So thank you. Thank you, Rodrigo, for a fascinating and interesting talk. I, I've like always My pleasure. A lot. And uh, now I'd like to hand over to. Uh, Azita, I think, for the next uh, talk. Thank you, Dr. Marinis. The next speaker is Dr. Weltaha. Community posterior seal fracture, please, Dr. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's my pleasure to be uh, with you all. Uh, so we are going. We are going to talk about the posterior shear uh, fractures. Now, what I'm going to do, I'm going to divide this presentation into three parts. In the first part, we are going very briefly to go over the the classification of tibial plateau fractures and um, uh, try to understand um, how do you choose your approach based on understanding the classification. And then we'll go over the different approaches. In the second part, we'll go over some of the ca- some cases that will help elicit some of the principles that we are talking about. And then at the end, we'll go over some special techniques for special fractures. And then we'll go over an algorithm that you could use for management managing these posterior plateau uh, fractures. So, and we all know that that tibia plateau fractures go over a very broad spectrum of injuries. They start from low velocity injuries to high velocity injuries. They are very frequently associated with long term complications. However, if they are reduced well and fixed well, the outcome is usually very favorable. Posterior shearing fractures were less appreciated uh, in the past. And um, till now, they're not very common. However, we are starting to see them more and more because now we recognize them more. 
Um, however, if we do fail to recognize them, or if there is a problem with the or the obtaining an atomical fixation, these usually don't have a very, very favorable outcome. They're usually associated with um, knee instability, which could result in early osteoarthritis. Now, Schatzker, when he um, proposed his classification in 1974, this was mainly based on the use of x-rays. At that time, CT was not very common. So it was a two-dimensional representation. And, and he classified these, these, these fractures into our, the well-known classification that we, we know, which helped with, 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 um, uh, with the surgical approaches, mainly depending on where the fracture were. And uh, at that time, they proposed two main um, approaches, the anterolateral approach and the postural medial approach. However, with time, people started recognizing these coronal plane uh, fractures and started seeing these, 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 these injuries to the posterior part of the, of the plateau. But because the, fracture, the classification did not address these fractures very cl clearly, they were usually um, missed. And sometimes they would, you would see the fracture, but they were not uh, fixed because people didn't know how to um, uh, approach them. In 2010, Kong Ping Lo and his group uh, proposed the three-column uh, classification of the tibial plateau in which he addressed these posterior um, uh, injuries. He divided the tibial plateau into a medial and lateral column as well as a posterior uh, column. And, and the posterior column injuries will usually result from flexion uh, injuries. Now, the beauty of this classification that it, it laid the way for new approaches to the tibial plateau. We know the anterolateral approach as well as the posterior medial approach, but now since people started recognizing these, uh, these, these injuries in the posterior uh, plateau, new approaches started to be uh, developed. Uh, there are some of those that address the the uh, the posterior me the posterior medial part, the posterolateral part. We have approaches that go through the um, um, uh, the uh, uh, fibular, uh, the proximal fibular uh, neck, and we have other approaches. Now you could extend the anterolateral approach through an epicondyle osteotomy, and that will give you an extensive approach uh, that that would give you access to the whole, the, almost the whole of the lateral of the lateral condyle. Um, this led Schatzker to revise his his tibial plateau fracture, and in um, in a, in, a, in, a, in a publication that came out a few years ago, they also started recognizing these uh, posterior injuries. Um, and, and, and they divided the, pro the, the, the uh, tibia plateau into four quadrants, not equal, but they are into four quadrants, an anterolateral, anteromedial, and a posteromedial, and a posterolateral. And this started... Um, um, uh, people became more familiar and, and started looking and picking up these injuries uh, more frequently. So let's go over some some uh, some cases to elicit this. Um, uh, this first case is a 34-year-old female nurse who fell from a height while she was hiking. She came complaining of knee pain. This neurovascular was intact. Initially, looking at the AP, you could see that there is a radiolucent um, shadow here. Uh, the lateral plateau in, in, in general looks, looks okay. Uh, there may be something in the medial, but as you look into the lateral, you could immediately see that there is something wrong here at the, at the posterior, at the posterior part of the top plateau. Doing the CT scan, you could easily see, see now that there's a shear fracture in the posterior um, uh, plateau, uh, and there was also a, a, a depression um, element. So this was approached through a uh, postrolateral ap approach. Um, uh, the, uh, the shear fracture was addressed with a buttress uh, plate, uh, the depression was um, elevated through the fracture initially, and these screws were used as a wrapped screw to support the uh, depression in the uh, in the posterior uh, in the posterior column. Uh, this is um, uh, a follow up picture, and this is the follow up at about five years. She was having a very good range of 
um, uh, of motion with a very stable knee. Now, the second case is a 29-year-old male who was a military um, officer. He was involved in a motor vehicle accident. Um, he had an associated head and abdominal injury. He was in ICU for a couple of days. The x-ray of the knee, again, you could see that there is something going on here in the in the um, um, in the in the lateral part of the t of the of the of the of the, of the proximal tibia. There is a line extending down here, and there is something that looks like a second fracture, which may suggest an ACL tear. Now, doing the CT scan again, you could see that there is comminution and there is a shear fracture of the posterior of the postromedial. Uh, plateau, and here going into the uh, into the the coronal views, you could clearly see that there is a shear with comminution of the posterior rim of the uh, uh, of the uh, tibial plateau, as well as a an evolution of the AC. Uh, ACL. So this was approached initially. We used a, a postromedial plate to address the fracture in the medial condyle, and then an, 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 uh, another approach to the to the lateral uh, condyle was 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 performed in order to um, address the posterior shear uh, with a buttress uh, plate. Um, and then the patient uh, was was um, uh, had an anterior uh, approach where the ACL was was um, uh, anchored with the use of heavy sutures. Um, on follow up, this is the follow up at about one year. He was having still he was um, uh, having some pain in the um, uh, in the in the knee. However, his range of motion was reasonable. At five years, um, he's, he, the pain had disappeared. Um, he, there was evidence of, of some laxity in the, in the knee. However, the patient didn't want to have anything, uh, done for him at that, at that, at that stage. The third case is a 43 year old male, uh, was, who was transferred from another hospital three days after a history of fall. The AP X ray again shows that there is, there is a lesion on the medial side, which looks like the, the depression fracture, and there is something here on the lateral side. Uh, he was taken to the operating room where he had an X-fix applied because of um, severe soft tissue uh, swelling. And on the lateral, you could clearly see this, there's a shear fracture here on the lateral condyle. The CT scan was done after the application of the um, X-fix, and you could clearly see that there is severe comminution um, uh, in, the, in the lateral condyle as well as a depression on the medial on the medial side. Uh, this was approached through a transfibular approach, and um, we through the fracture itself, uh, the depression on the medial side was elevated, and a screw was put there as as a small rafting for it and then two plates were put one was put posterolateral through the same approach to support the uh, the uh, shear fracture and another one was put on the lateral side to to support the, the fixation this uh, x-ray was obtained today i was fortunate that we had him in the clinic today so we took this x-ray and uh, we added it to the to the presentation. Um, so the these principles, as you could see, remain the same. Whenever you have a, 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 a shear fragment, you try to buttress that and use that buttress uh, plate over the area uh, where you have this column fracture and the and, and the, sh the, the the shearing has uh, has occurred. Uh, if there is comminution, uh, then uh, we usually result, especially in the metaphysis, you would use a plate in the form of a bridging plate to address to address that. Now, in some situations where you have a bicondylar involvement of the uh, uh, posterior uh, plateau, uh, you may need some special uh, tricks to address this. This is a, uh, um, um, a publication from 2016 by... Uh, Vincenzo uh, Gordiano from Brazil, in which he described using a one-third tubular plate that is contoured in a special way that you put it around the posterior um, uh, tibial plateau. You, you, you need two approaches, a, a, a medial or posteromedial approach to, to expose the, the posteromedial part, and then a lateral um, uh, approach. He used here a transfibular uh, approach 
um, in order to uh, address the fracture on the on the on the lateral on the lateral side. After that, once you have you have reduced your fracture and fixed it with your K wires, you pass a um, periosteliator or a small cup around the uh, the t the tibia from the posterior aspect uh, in a subperiosteal dissection. And once you've done that, then you pass a pre-contoured one-third tubular uh, plate uh, from lateral to medial. Uh, on the la on the medial, once once th this comes out on the on the lateral side, you hook it with a screw on the medial side. Then use a pointed reduction forceps to close that uh, plate, and this will up this will create tension on the posterior uh, plateau and help in the reduction of the. Um, of the uh, of the posterior of the posterior um, elements, um, the, their conclusion was that this plate, which they called the hoop plate, may be a good um, uh, alternative for the management of extensive tibial plateau articular fractures with impaction, um, especially of the posterior uh, rim. Now, to conclude uh, what we've talked about, I would like to present this 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 algorithm that was also presented by Gordano and his and his group, where they did a review of the literature and looked at the different patterns of posterior uh, plateau fractures and the different approaches that are used to address this. And then they came up with an algorithm um, to address this, and they 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 mainly looked at the posterior fragments. Um, in in these in the context of being a pure split fracture, uh, split with a depression, or if there is a pure depression on the medial side, uh, which could be contained or non uh, contained. So when you have a shear type posterior lateral tibial plateau fractures, it could be one of three. It could be an isolated posterior uh, tibial plateau fracture. It could be a complex lateral plateau fracture, or it could be a bilateral. Uh, lat uh, bilateral uh, condylar fractures. In the case of a isolated posterior lateral plateau fractures, they suggested the po posterior lateral approach utilizing something like a Carlson approach where the patient is placed in a prone position and you do a direct posterior approach and use a buttressing technique as described before. In case you have a complex lateral tibial plateau fracture, then you may use something like a posterolateral um, uh, approach in the lateral uh, uh, position. You may also use a transfibular neck osteotomy. This gives you a better uh, uh, exposure of the lateral uh, condyle. And in some situations, you may use an extend extended anterolateral approach with a, a, a with a femoral epicondyle osteotomy however this approach doesn't give you a a a, a, a good axis you could look at the posterolateral uh, piece but it becomes a little bit tricky to put your plate uh, through this this approach and lastly if you have uh, posterior uh, bicondylar plateau fractures, then you could use a um, the the uh, Kung Fing Lo approach, uh, which is uh, a post an inverted L uh, shape uh, approach to the medial condyle in the prone position. However, the patient may need to know that he will also need an, a, a lateral approach as it may become difficult to approach the lateral condyle through this. Uh, through this approach. So usually if there's a posterior bicondylar tibial plateau fracture, it may be easier to use two approaches as I showed in some of the cases we presented. Now, if you have a rim fracture of the posterolateral tibial plateau, it is one of two situations. Either it is an, a, a, a contained pure depression or it is a non-contained. Non-contained means that there is there is a lot of comminution with the with the depression. In these situations, you may um, use a Lopenhoff um, transfibular uh, osteotomy, where the patient is in a supine position and you have a direct approach to the postulator exposure, and 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 we use the same principles we've used for the uh, uh, for, for 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 the other fractures. Um, if you have a uh, uh, if if, if you may also use an extender anterolateral approach and use a uh, the hoop plate uh, concept that we've discussed before. If there is a medial cortical, uh, if you have a purely depression, you may use a medial cortical window uh, to approach this to elevate the depression 
um, as we do for an for an anterolateral depression uh, in the same way and uh, uh, use the fluoroscopy or arthroscopy to assess uh, your uh, reduction and then use sub subchondral screws as a rafting technique to support uh, the fixation. So in summary, these are not as common as the anterior, anterior the um, as the lateral and the medial condyle injuries. However, if they are missed, they can cause a lot of knee instability. It is very crucial to understand the injury, which side needs to be approached, where do you have the shearing injury, because you need to approach uh, the posterior element from the place from from the direction where you are going to put your. Uh, buttress plate. For shear, shear injuries, we still use the buttress plate as we do for the an anterolateral fractures. For rim fractures, uh, especially with comminution or involving both condyles, you may uh, elect to use the hoop uh, plate. And we've discussed together the algorithm for the treatment of the posterior plateau fractures. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Taha for very interesting topics. I have a question for you. As you mentioned as your uh, case, it's may uh, associated with uh, multiple trauma, like abdominal injury or head injury. Uh, when actually is the best time to perform fixation, whereas maybe another department want to do the surgery for their field, and afterward patient take to the ICU, Whereas we know that the bone in that your area is uh, uh, is uh, have uh, limited time to reduce. Do you have any experience for that? So, so usually um, um, in these situations, we 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 try to if the patient does have head injuries, abdominal injuries, and needs to be uh, observed in the ICU, and his situation doesn't. Um, allow us to take him to the to the operating room. Uh, we 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 try to apply an external fixator as soon as possible on these, and then let him go to the to the ICU and stay there for as long as they need, and then bring them bring them back. Um, uh, usually, like if this is a long bone, we usually wait for four or five days. But in these situations, we may need to wait even longer, especially if there is soft tissue. Uh, uh, swelling and involvement. However, the thing that we have observed with these posterior plateau fractures is that when you put the X fix on, it's not necessarily, they don't necessarily reduce well, like if you have um, an, um, a lateral condyle uh, fracture. In order to make sure that they reduce well, they have to be in absolute uh, extension of the knee, which sometimes may, may, be, may be difficult for other reasons. Um, and, and so we just put the X-Fix on to limit the movement around the fracture so that it, 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 the, the soft tissue gets a better chance to heal um, and also to try and improve the vascularity in the, uh, in the limb. Okay, uh, thank you for the answer. And for the injury with concomitant avulsion of the PCL, when do you consider for arthroscopic? Okay, so if there is a concomitant PCL injury, um, we usually what we do is that we will fix the bone initially first, um, and then we do an examination on, under uh, under anesthesia to assess first of all the stability in the knee, and especially to make sure that the patient doesn't have a postural lateral in, uh, injury as well. So if it's a pure PCL, we usually wait. Um, let the patient recover from 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 his from his surgery, and then six weeks to two six months weeks. later, we will we will address the P, the, the PCL. If there is a concomitant uh, posterolateral instability, we once we fix the bone and we can enlist, uh, demonstrate that there is posterolateral instability, that is addressed immediately. Interesting, thank you. And uh, th that's the kind of plate that I just see is um, who 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 played right. Is that uh, cause uh, vascular issues using that plane? No, no. You, you. What, what you need to do is that when you're putting, when you're, when you're dissecting with the cob, you need to flex the knee uh, to about twenty to twenty-five degrees because that would relax the posterior uh, mm -hmm. 
structures uh, and so you but you you need to do it with the help of the image intensifier to make sure first of all that you're not sliding off the the bone superiorly and then at the same time you have to make sure that you're on bone all the uh, all the time while you're doing the the uh, the, uh, the dissection okay i see and, thank and you it's better yeah. and it's better to use a small cup because the cup is 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 like you have this rounded surface on the on the on the uh, opposite on on the uh, on back side so that should cover that that should protect the soft tissue okay sir and uh, the technique recommended that we should use is slightly under contour plate whereas uh, we know that the how if we use very articular plates that which cannot be easily contoured and it will um, change the whole screw. So, so if you're using a, a, a periarticular plate that is not really the shape of the, of the, of, of the bone, um, it depends what are you using it for. So if you're depending on the screws um, uh, to obtain some lagging, uh, then you need to make sure that the plate is is exactly the shape of the uh, of the bone. So you may need to contour the, the plate. However, if you put your lag screws in, and now you're using this as a neutralizing device or just as a buttress, where you the, the most important screw is the one below the the apex of the fracture, then you don't need the the plate to be uh, anatomically. Uh, fitting the bone, especially if you're lock using locking head screws. So there are there are there is a, there are two situations. If you're using the plate to obtain compression, mm -hmm. it has to be anatomically right. um, uh, contoured to the bone. So you may need to to contour your your plate if it doesn't fix well. However, if you're using it and depending on the locking uh, head screws. Uh, then in that situation, you don't need to, if it can be a little bit off bone, that's, that's, that's fine. However, in these situations, you're using independent screws out of the, of the plate to obtain your, your compression. Yeah. And another question from Francis. Uh, should the posterior lateral rim fracture be fixed? Whereas we know that uh, weight bearing acid is mostly posterior medial. Um, the, you, should the posterolateral rim, posterior lateral rim uh, fracture lateral be fixed? Be fixed. Be fixed. Um, they should be fixed. Um, we know that most of the weight goes through the medial side. However, if in inflection, the the, uh, the there is there is there is also weight that once you go beyond twenty to thirty degrees, there is a lot of weight that goes through the posterior posterolateral. Uh, part of, of, of the joint. Now, in full extension, most of the weight goes through the medial side, but once you go beyond 25 to 30 degrees of flexion, it goes on to the whole posterior aspect of the knee. So it is very important. And this is where they start feeling instability if it's not, if it's not fixed, is that when they flex, they feel that their knee is starting to become unstable. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Taha. Um... My pleasure. Yes, yeah. Dr. Marinis? Oh, I think it's uh, Dr. Sassi, yeah? Oh, yeah, sorry. Dr. Sassi. No problem. Uh, uh, now I uh, invite Dr. Hakan to give us a uh, talk on managing the bicondylar tibial plateau fractures. Over to Dr. Hakan. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to congratulate uh, uh, my dear friend, Dr. Mary Papers and APTS uh, Executive Committee for their great efforts for organiz organizing these uh, very well-planned educational activities. Uh, what are our aims in the treatment of bicondylar tibial plateau flexures? First of all, an anatomical joint reduction is essential. And uh, the joint uh, block orientation according to the shaft is very important. We should decrease uh, the condylar width up to the normal. And also we should restore the length alignment and rotation of the shaft. And when to fix these uh, difficult fractures? As we know, uh, most of them are caused by 
very high uh, energy injuries, the recommended treatment is stage treatments. Uh, by this uh, literature, uh, we can show that uh, by application of a joint spanning fixator, uh, the complications can be reduced up to 8.4% uh, septic complications with this type of stage treatment. This is an other uh, article about this. And uh, the authors report that even they have, uh, they had 22 open fractures and also three compartment syndromes. The average operation, definitive uh, operation time is 15 day. The infection and wound dehiscence rate is 5%. And on later uh, literature, we can show that by this method, we can reduce up to 3.8% uh, infection uh, with uh, stage treatment and double incision. So we should, first of all, place a joint spanning external fixator uh, shown like this in bicondylar fractures. And the distal tibial pins should be as uh, distal as possible to prevent uh, um, pin tract related uh, infections. And then after, after the application of this uh, fixator, we should plan our treatments. We have many surgical approaches for tibia plateau uh, fixation. How could we choose the most appropriate uh, approach? Uh, as we hear from the previous uh, speakers, uh, most of the recent classifications are based on uh, CT uh, evaluation and also based on column concepts. And I find the most useful classification is the German Knee Society 10 segment uh, CT based classification. By this uh, classification, we can uh, also predict uh, if we could, if we should use a transfibular uh, osteotomy or femoral epicondylar uh, osteotomy. But uh, most of the time, uh, we use two main approaches. One, this is the classical anterolateral approach, and the other is the classical posterior medial approach. What will be the uh, best timing for definitive treatment? Uh, the most important parameters are the wrinkle sign, re of the blisters, the edema and clinical status uh, of the patients. So is a single locked lateral plate sufficient for a bicondylar fracture? The answer is no. Uh, we know that two plates are uh, nearly always better than a single uh, plate. From this literature, we can see that even if the dual plates are conventional plates, not lock plates, they are uh, much better than a single lock plate. As you can see from the diagrams, the subsidence is significantly less in double plating. And these are also the literature favoring uh, double plating in bicondylar fractures. And if uh, we have a posterior medial fragment, even it is, if it is non-displaced and even if the patient is in a non-weight bearing protocol, during rehabilitation, it will displace if it is not fixed. So we should always fix the posterior medial fragments uh, to prevent uh, dislocation of the non-displaced fragment. So what are the helpful equipment in our surgery? We should place a pillow under our uh, uh, knee to release the gastrocnemius and to restore the alignment and rotation, we could use a universal femoral distractor. If we don't have it, we can also use a simple uh, orthofix type, uh, LRS type external fixator, and we can use some uh, variety of clamps during the reduction. I want to uh, present some case examples. This is a 35 years old male, a cardiovascular surgeon. You see uh, some cognition also on the metaphysical side. These are the CT cuts and you see the depressed fragments. 
Uh, in these bicondylar fractures, we should first begin with the simpler side. And most of the time, the medial side is more simple. So this is the medial side. I opened it and uh, reduced it and put a medial plate. And then uh, with an anterolateral uh, hockey shape incision, you see the meniscal sutures. Uh, we made a submeniscal arthrotomy. And we can easily evaluate uh, by direct vision our uh, reduction. You see the depressed fragment. If you don't want to open the lateral wall, you should uh, uh, you, you can make a hole in the lateral side, and by using a temp, you can by this way elevate the lateral plateau, as you can see. And uh, after the elevation of the plateau, you see the joint is. Uh, perfectly uh, aligned. And then uh, by rafting technique, uh, we put our subchondral leg screws and control it uh, in the also in the lateral position. And these are the leg screws for the shaft portion. And after that, we put a uh, buttress plate in the lateral side. You can see these uh, raft screws, leg screws. And this is the final construct. And after fixation, we can tie our meniscal sutures to the plate holes, as you can see. These are the immediate postoperative radiograms. These are the immediate clinical picture, the lateral side. And these are postoperative two years follow-up radiograms. And this is the new motion of the patient. Another case, a 54 years old female, you see, uh, there is a fracture dislocation. You see the femoral medial condyle and uh, medial tibial condyle are not uh, in the same uh, alignment. And you see the lateral depression and the posterior medial fragments in these CT cuts. This is the posterior medial approach for the posterior medial fragment. You see the pesanserinus. And uh, between the pes anserinus and gastrocnemius, you can reach the posterior medial fragment easily. And by the help of the reduction clamps, uh, I put some temporary key wires and then a buttress plate from the posterior side. And this is the clinical picture. And then turning back to the lateral side, uh, by the way I previously showed, by a help of a temp, I elevate the lateral side. This is the hole that used for clamp. By direct visualization and fluoroscopy, you can check the reduction. And I put some leg screws on the AP plane. And then this is the lateral plate application. These are immediate postoperative, and this is postoperative four months follow up. You can see the incisions and the knee motion. Another case, a very high uh, energy trauma. You see there is also a fracture dislocation in this uh, patient. And you see a very comminuted lateral uh, part. You see the extensor mechanism, uh, including tuberosus tibia, also injured. You see a double, uh, double shadow sign and a posterior translation of the posterior fragment. This is a joint spanning external fixator, as we uh, also uh, always apply in these high energy injuries. And we, these are the CT cuts, and these are the steps of uh, reduction. You see, from I begin from the medial side. This is the medial plating, and then come to the most uh, comminuted lateral part. You see the disruption of the extensor mechanism. And you see there are some small K wires. Uh, the lateral part is very uh, commuted. So I fix the lateral part on the, on the table, on the surgical table, and then uh, elevate the central part of the lateral plateau by the help of a temp. And by this way, with a collinear reduction clamp, you see the reduction and fixation of the lateral site and this is immediate postoperative radiogram this is 14 months follow-up 
and you see the joint motion and you can see uh, the extensor mechanism is good after the fixation and repair. This is an interesting case, a 43 years old male, a bicondylar fracture, but this is a special fracture that uh, reported by Dr. Firuz body. This is a hyper extension varus type bicondylar tibia fracture. In this pattern, there's loss of the normal posterior slope. There's a tension failure of the posterior cortex, a compression of the anterior cortex, and a various deformity in the coronal plane. These are the CT cuts. This is the medial approach. And you see the use of collinear clamp, elevation of the joint surface, fixation of the medial side. You can see posterior, uh, proximal posterior angle is restored. And then from the lateral side, the other plate fixation. This is a very high injury patient, also 42 years old male, injured in a water ski accident. Uh, he had also a segmented chest fracture, knee dislocation, popliteal artery injury, perineal nerve injury, and compartment syndrome. These are the first uh, radiograms. You see in the right hand side, the popliteal artery is blocked in the proximal tibia region. And we put a uh, temporary fixator and when we measure the compartment pressures, in one compartment 62, in the other 74 millimeters, and we make a uh, double incision fasciotomy. This is during popliteal artery repair. And after some time, we uh, put some grafts on one side and uh, close on the other side and put a circular external fixator. These are the immediate radiograms. You see the status, and these are after healing of the uh, skin and the uh, bone. And this is the uh, later follow-up range of motion of the patient. And the last uh, patient is a, uh, a suicider, a 15 years old female with a very comminuted double uh, bicondylar fracture dislocation. This is a joint spanning fixator. You can see a very, very comminuted uh, joint block, you can see. And uh, for comparing the uh, joint uh, widening, we always measure the healthier side uh, to compare our reduction. This is before the definitive fixation. You see she has uh, a morbid obese patient. This is the medial plating. You see there is some fracture dislocation uh, on the medial side. And after placement, I elevate the medial side. And as, uh, as Dr. Pesantes uh, said that I use a colonial lamp, uh, clamp to reduce this medial fragment and then reduce uh, also, and these are the temporary key wires. And this is an anterior plate to buttress the comminuted parts. And this is unfortunately the lateral part, the very comminuted lateral part. And I fixed uh, these uh, multifragmented parts in the surgical table. These are during reduction. The parts are very small, so I couldn't use red screws, but I use subcontrol K wires. And this is after fixation. And you can see this is immediate postoperative radiogram. And this is seven months uh, postoperative radiogram. And this is approximately one year. You see the joint orientation is very good. And the alignment is good, and there is no shortening. So what are the take-home messages? Uh, Biochondral fractures are very high energy injuries, so we should evaluate well. We should always place a joint spanning fixator, then make the CT evaluation. We should begin from the simpler side. Uh, for joint uh, evaluation, we should make a submensical arthroscopy. 
our aim is anatomical reduction of the joint surface. We should fix, first of all, with leg screws by the rafting technique. We can use grafting and bone substitutes. We should always use double, maybe triple plating, uh, according to the column concept. And we should also restore the length alignment and rotation of the shelf. We should begin early motion, but uh, delayed weight, uh, weight bearing for these injuries. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hakan. Uh, you took us through a complex constellation of uh, bicondylar tibial plateau fractures, uh, the treatment nuances and the challenges uh, in handling these fractures. I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, during fixing uh, these bicondylar fractures, uh, intraoperatively, how do we uh, understand the posterior tibial slope is raised to? Uh, by the help of uh, fluoroscopy. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, I use a, a long K wire and put uh, the anatom uh, anatomical axis, the K wire on the anatomical axis in the lateral view. And uh, I make a fluoroscopy uh, view parallel to joint lines in the septal okay. plane and compare the posterior proximal angle it should be around 81 uh, degrees there should be a 7 to 9 degrees posterior slope of the yes uh, in case if we are not able to uh, reconstruct the slope so what do you recommend like in, it's a back most... capture with bag of bones uh -huh. no i don't use the bag of bones technique uh, right. if uh, most of the time uh, if there is a posterior medial or posterior lateral combination, we, uh, uh, we should use posterior approach to restore uh, the posterior slope. So by using the posterior approach, we can easily ma uh, make a buttress plate fixation and it will uh, hold our uh, reduction. But if there are very comminuted fracture parts. Uh, I use circular fixator and first put uh, four or five K wires and uh, connect them to the ring. And by using joints, uh, we can uh, arrange uh, the posterior slope uh, to the shaft by using uh, some hinges. But uh, in most of the time, in the ordinary uh, posterior involvement, we can uh, restore the posterior alignment by uh, open reduction and plating. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hakan. Uh, Dr. Hakan, you said uh, to start with the easier side in fixing the bicondylar fractures, but uh, we were taught to start with lateral and finish with lateral while fixing the medial first. Is that not correct? Uh, can you repeat the question? I, I couldn't understand the last part of uh, the question. Uh, yeah, like uh, if uh, we have to start with the lateral side and finish with the lateral side, uh, but you are recommending to uh, like fix with the medial side first. So is it correct? In bicondylar fractures, most of the time, the medial side is not very convenient. So I most of the time begin with the medial side, but if the lateral side is not convenient and simple, we can choose the first uh, lateral side and build the joint lock according to the lateral side. We can restore the length alignment according to the lateral side and then come back to the posterior medial fragments. Yes, it is not a rule, but most of the time, the simplest side is medial. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I have one more question. Uh, currently, uh, the concept in AO uh, says uh, fixing all the soft tissues, that is the ligament injuries are like meniscus or an ACL if it is associated or present, along with fixing the fractures in the same sitting. Do you recommend it? Uh, we have a very good uh, sport injury guy team in our uh, faculty. So uh, during pre-operative planning, we discussed the uh, uh, injury patterns 
uh, but most of the time, as Dr. Taha uh, said, our uh, doctors prefer uh, later uh, definitive surgery for most of the ligamentous injuries, unless if they are bony evulsion injuries or our surgical incision is directly uh, on these injuries, they can directly repair, but for uh, difficult reconstructions, they want to, they want some bone healing and then they uh, proceed to the uh, ligamentous injury patterns. But most of the time, if there is a meniscal injury during our surgical press, uh, procedure, we can repair the meniscal injury. Very good, Hakan. That was um, a terrific, um, terrific talk. Thank you. Very informative. So if the faculty could turn their cameras on, that'd be great. We'll, we'll bounce around a few questions now and um, we'll start and, and the moderators too. That's great. Yeah, we'll start maybe, maybe with Dennis. Dennis, there was a question that came that uh, often um, people think about, and that is how much depression do you accept on the lateral side? And what are the factors that influence that decision? You know, it's a tough, tough question. Uh, I think, I mean, uh, classically, we accept like Q, QMM of articular displacement. Of course, the lateral side is the forgiving side. We know that um, more weight is on medial side. If the knee is not subluxed, probably articular step a little bit, gap a little bit, probably fine, unless the rim is not okay. So, for, I mean, the post lateral rim is important. The knee may sublux if the post lateral rim is displayed posteriorly. But if it's just a pure central depression around two to three millimeter, probably the patient may do well. Of course, it, the other second factor you consider is can you do it better intraoperatively? I mean, um, if that is a kind of not too complex fracture, maybe you can use a bone tam to punch it out, arthroscopically assess the fracture, percutaneous situation. Then I, I think uh, we can still do it. So, um, so in the surgeon's ability to whether they can are uh, confident to make better is also important. But otherwise, I think not subluxing a knee is the most important. Yeah, Rodrigo, what what would you accept as depression on the lateral side, and what what sort of factors would influence your decision making? I agree with Danny. It's probably two millimeters, and if you take a look at the older studies. The more we look at them, uh, it says that basically you can tolerate uh, the depression as thick as the thickness of the cartilage, but more than that is not good enough. And uh, you can deal with that, especially if they are under the meniscus. If they are not under the meniscus, then I try to put it back into place. But uh, if you look at the article that probably was uh, Wild that showed it or, or, or Dennis, the one with uh, Mauricio Kifuri's latest article, if you read that, they said that we focus a lot on, um, on getting a perfect joint reduction, but now more try to get, as Hakan said on the first slide, get the alignment perfectly in the AP and ladder is probably better uh, and, uh, and to restore the rim, not only the, 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 the steps, mainly the rim, and the alignment are better than the steps. So yeah, Hakan, how much do you chase the um, the articular reduction when you're trying to maintain a, a mechanical alignment? Like how, how hard do you chase that reduction? Uh, I think both of them are very important. And, uh, if you open, uh, th uh, there are some articles that show that we shouldn't depend only fluoroscopy because uh, uh, open reduction is better most of the time than fluoroscopy. We should directly visualize the joint and also use the fluoroscopy for uh, anatomical reduction. But uh, as uh, Rodrigo said, uh, anatomical reduction is very important, but the alignment is also very important. So. Uh, I will go to the end <laughs> uh, as far as I can <laughs> uh, do it. Right. I just think sometimes it's really hard with very osteoporotic bone, very comminuted fractures, and sometimes we have to accept a little bit less as long as we have uh, mechanical alignment. And it's the, the challenge in the operating room to, 
I, I think it's that element of how much better can we make it? How much, how far do we chase it? So, well, yes. I have a, a, a question for you too. You know, everyone keeps talking about the rim. And as we know, there are rims and there are rims, right? There are rims that are a part of the fracture configuration and there are rims that are indicating capsular injury and uh, soft tissue injury and, uh, and may contribute to instability. How, how do you deal with the rims? And there was a question earlier if that posterolateral rim is relatively undisplaced, do you leave it alone or do you chase it with some hardware? Oh, well, that that is that is a, um, a a difficult question. Like, if you have a postural lateral rim fracture that is not displaced, uh, you just see this like 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 a, a a bony injury on the on the CT scan with no depression. Now, what what would you do with it? Uh, again, I would go to the this this this. Um, if this is an isolated injury, then most probably in these situations, um, I would do an examination under anesthesia. If the knee in general seems to be stable, um, uh, I may I may and 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 uh, there's no other injury to the knee. I may treat these conservatively. Uh, observe them. Uh, make sure that there is no further displacement as 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 you go on, and then treat them conservatively. However, if there's any sign of instability when you're examining this, I would go and 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 and, and fix them. Um, and the idea of this small plate that goes around is 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 very helpful. You don't need to use uh, one that goes all the way around, but but you you may use one. Sometimes I use the. Uh, the plates from the uh, distal radius, uh, the L plate from the distal radius. Sometimes I use that um, to to fix these rim rim, uh, rim fractures. Um, uh, so so that's usually how I would approach them. I would do an examination of the anesthesia, try to force them into into valgus and varus, make sure it doesn't move. On the CT, it is only a rim fracture. There's nothing else involved. In these situations, I'll treat them conservatively. All right, and just on another point, Whale, because one of the topics that you talked about was obviously one of the topics we're debating at the moment and coming to terms with some of the issues. So, you know, whether you use a Lobenhofer or a Carlson approach, one of the challenges is that you're elevating the popliteus and maybe the posterior capsule to try and get the, the, uh, the reduction and the fixation. And that concerns us because these are injuries that are often associated with shear type injuries. And with ligamentous instability, what, what's your approach as you're coming to these intraoperative fracture situations to try and manage the tendency to instability? Yeah, again, uh, so, so, so if you're doing a, um, um, uh, for me, I like, I like the Lobenhofer approach. Um, 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 and I like doing the uh, the, uh, the fibular head osteotomy because it gives you such a very good exposure. And then when it the, the popliteal, there's usually a, an, an issue with the vascularity. And and if you take the popliteus completely off, um, you you may you there is still the possibility of of losing the st the stability. So I, I try to work myself around. Uh, doing a, a limited elevation of the popliteus muscle. I don't take it off completely. Um, uh, if, if I do need um, uh, to do a second approach, I may do that. However, seldom I have, I, I don't remember in a more than one or two cases where I needed to do a second approach to be able to look at, at to look at the, um, at, at, uh, at the joint. Um if you have released your tibialis anterior muscle well, and you have you you you're you're able to um, take off the popliteus from the lateral side um, um, close to the to the joint, um, um, uh, and 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 not completely take it off, I think you are you are still okay, provided that you do try to repair them again after you finish. You 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 would be okay. I haven't done many of these, so I'm not, I'm not, I haven't had 
many problems with 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 instability afterwards um i always do an examination under anesthesia once i finish just to make sure that this is not causing any any in, in uh, instability in the um in the knee um i haven't come across the situation where i i guess i'm just fortunate it, it, it may happen but i've been fortunate not to have a situation where i've done this approach and the patient ended in an instability um, so I, I would be interested also in knowing the opinions of others others as well, because I haven't come across this this problem till till now. Rodrigo, I've heard you give this talk a few times. Have you seen instability after these posterior shear fractures? Um, yes, Marine is uh, sometimes I see instability, and as as uh, Hanak mentioned, I also have a very good sports team that I send it to them to address some of these soft tissue injuries. Uh, because, you know, one thing as trauma surgeons is we're not as good as we think in dealing with uh, soft tissue injuries, but at least uh, we should be aware that they exist and, they, and that we should treat it, especially the, the ones that are uh, seen and gets to instability later on. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I, I think it's a matter of just thinking about them and at least diagnosing them. And particularly the posterolateral corner injuries, I think they're a, a key element to, to mobilizing the patient sort of moving forward, I agree. So Vivek, we've been talking around the back of the knee a little bit. If we come around to the front, sometimes the, the tibial plateau fracture and one of the ones that you showed was more anterior rather than posterior. And then it was extensive and also had a proximal third shaft fracture. When you're nailing these things through a suprapatellar port, do you ever have any troubles related to making the fracture worse or, or, or is it ne never really an issue? I think you may be on mute, Vivek. So the question of doing a suprapatellar or nailing in such fracture patterns, we need to analyze that fracture pattern very carefully. That where exactly is the fracture ending and whether it is anterior or posterior or central. Because... If we know and see the trajectory of the nail, in the first five centimeters, it's nearly anterior to three centimeters from anterior side. And the major part of our articular fragment fixation is going to be done behind the nail, which is nine millimeters to 10 millimeters. Uh, what we do is we put in our balls clamp, as well as K wires and one or two screws. We have air rooms for further fixation which we do for our plating as well as for the screws when we do our nailing. And after that, we also reassess our things and try to compress that if it has got loosened in between. But as I said, if my fracture or the articular depression is involving a midline anterior fracture, which is quite a big one, and which might encompass the entry point of my suprapatellar nail, maybe that one will not be the one where I would like to get this fixation through the suprapatellar nail. I might use a different option. My attempt and principle is that all, for all such fractures is to get the best articular reduction along with the alignment in such cases. So if my modality of fixation is going to hamper that, I might have to look at it from a different perspective and take up a backup also. Yeah, and, and you may have to use the double plating technique that you Yeah, described. that's why I showed both the cases because previously we were doing it through the double plating most of our cases. But when you have a long diapezial fractures, many plates are not long enough for us to give a good stability to the shaft while at the same time to the articular front. That's yeah. why we started so, using the diapezes. Yeah, nailing part. Yeah, no, thank you, Vivek. And you showed some great cases, and, and Hakan did as well. Um, and how can some of those cases, it was healed by steel. So, uh, you know, there, there is so much metal in there. What is the balance between enough and not enough? Because sometimes, you know, when we're coming back and unfortunately the, the joint has chondropathology and it develops degenerative joint disease and needs a knee replacement, the more steel I put in, the more my heart beats thinking I'm going to have to take it out at some stage. What, what's your approach? Uh, yes, uh, but I prefer uh, more uh, steel, <laughs> uh, not to uh, lose my reduction. Uh, 
if uh, but uh, of course without disturbing the soft tissues and increasing the uh, infection risk but uh, most of the time uh, if you achieve a good uh, joint reduction and alignment i i am working in our clinic approximately 25 years and maybe two or three patients came to me for a joint replacement uh, it is not uh, like a hip uh, an acetabular fracture or femoral head fracture most of the time when you uh, reduce uh, them the joint replacement needs are very maybe postponed or maybe um, so um, I, I i am very afraid of uh, losing my reduction and i use uh, our plates uh, very much maybe in the, in uh, knee prosthesis surgery the our subchondral uh, subchondral uh, key wires or screws are uh, in danger but we can easily take out them during the prosthesis. yeah well what, what's been your experience well thank you uh, hakan with um degenerative joint disease and um, uh, in these very complex fractures? Um, very interesting question. Um, you know, in general with tibia plateau fractures, sometimes you do have a very bad looking um, injury. And then even after you fix them, the joint may look may not look the best. However, what I've noticed that if, if, as said before, if the alignment is okay, somehow they do well. They don't complain that much of knee pain. It is when you've disturbed the axis of the joint, that's when they usually develop arthrosis, arthrosis that is symptomatic. Um, um, we, we, we strive to, to, to obtain an anatomical reduction. We try to make sure that the fragments are less than two millimeters, um, you know, displaced at the, at, the, at, the, at, the, uh, at the joint line. But that's not usually easy. It's especially in these complex fractures, it's not usually easy. Um, but if you some, somehow, I don't know why, but if you, if you reduce the fracture and align, I, I mean, if you obtain the right axis, they seem to do well. Yeah. Despite not having an, a, a, a perfect, you know, uh, uh, joint redu reduced, as long as the alignment is OK, they seem to do to do uh, to do well. So I think the alignment is much it's, it's a very I won't say much more important, but it's very vital in, 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 in the outcome compared to the to the amount of comminution or reduction at the joint itself. Yeah, Rodrigo. Uh, yeah, Marini, same thing as well. And if you look at the literature, it's uh, about 7.3% that is reported of, of knee replacement after uh, complex tibial plateau fractures, 10 years follow-up. And I do agree with well, and uh, it uh, also says Mauricio Kifuri and Schatzker get the right alignment is key, restore the rim, and then perfect anatomical reduction of the joint. But if you have to pick up of those, I do agree with Wild. Pick up to get the right alignment also on the AP and lateral, and lateral planes. That's how I can show on his first slide. Yeah, Vivek, that makes it really challenging sometimes, you know, because that, that medial fragment has a tendency to be reduced into varus. You know, uh, how much varus can you accept on that medial side when you have those very complex fractures? difficult to say actually intraoperatively that what is the angle that we are measuring and what are the degrees for me i would always like to get an opposite side view first because many a times in these deformed cases or the man or the extreme complex cases we don't know exactly whether patients are having a already varus knees or not so i always like to get in my complex or in type 6 cases opposite knee definitely, so that I know what morphology I'm dealing with. And I try to recreate that as much as possible. In India, especially in the Asian population, we see that there is a inbuilt tibia vera, which is quite common in them. And that leads to more osteoarthritis. So we need to take that also into account. And that's why opposite knee gives us a great idea. 
maybe around five degrees if it is such a complex fracture that I'll accept not more than that at all. But main aim is to get as much as alignment similar to what is there in the opposite side so that the alignment of both the knees remains the same. Yeah, thank you, Vivek. And uh, Dennis, you know, one of the challenges we have is how tight to impact the bone graft into the proximal tibial plateau. And it comes from the tightness, if you like, and the, of, a, of a pace that doesn't set properly to impaction grafting. And one of my colleagues in South Australia, Bogdan Solomon, does impaction grafting and has fully weight bearing as tolerated. How tight do they need to pack their bone grafting, Dennis? Um, actually, I will think, um, I mean, I used to have a bone substitute in cell bone graft because uh, people don't like you take addition wounds. But anyway, um, I would think usually the problem is too much. Uh, that actually makes your reduction not possible. It, it jams in the fracture gap. Um, or sometimes it falls out into the posterior soft tissue. So uh, usually I try to put a lot and then discover, okay, I jam my own reduction and I take it back. So usually that is the case. And at the end, there's uh, only half of what I initially put in. Um, I would think most of the time they really don't make a lot of mechanical sense because um, you 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 really depends on your plate and screw more than those bone graft unless it's really a tricolic graft but it's very difficult to tailor it to the exact height that you can put in right so most of the time it, it doesn't really make a lot of mechanical sense just some biological sense of void filler so i think not no need to be too tight yeah because you know rodrigo thought he may be a little uh mad when he was weight bearing them as tolerated how much graft do you have to put in? You know, you showed one of the fractures was a really, very thin rim fracture with a significant impaction. You know, that was only almost an inch, two and a half centimeters down. And, and they worry us because the meniscus is down there as well. And when you lift the meniscus and you lift the articular surface, it's just the rim of articular cartilage that's, that's there. How, how much bone graft do you use in that situation? Hakan, how much bone graft would you use in that situation? Oh, I, I understand you are asking the question to Rodrigo. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I don't go mad with the bone grafting. I always use uh, autologous bone grafting and uh, I uh, insert as much as I can uh, draw back from the iliac crest. So I depend mainly on the ref screws and butt splitting. I bone graft, but not that so much. Yeah. Well, everyone, I think it's been a, a very, uh, very uh, interesting, very educational evening. Uh, I think we, we probably would agree that mechanical alignment is very important and articular reduction is very important. And the hardware only facilitates those two principles. And we need to, especially in the high energy injuries, we need to uh, make sure that we manage the soft tissues and we think about the timing of our surgery, that we don't do this very complex surgery, either too late in the night or too early before the swellings had a chance to settle. So on behalf of all the participants, I'd like to thank uh, Dennis Yi, Vivek Trika, Rodrigo Pasantes, Wael Taha and Hakan Klink for all their um, information, for the time they spent preparing their talks. And I think for the honesty um, where they are answering those questions, which were challenging questions, and some of them do not have uh, strong answers yet at this point in time. I'd also uh, like to thank Dr. Simon Diswari and Dr. Azita for uh, their moderating. Thank you very much for uh, keeping us to time. I'd like to thank uh, Jamal uh, Ashraf for all his assistance and help uh, in putting the back end of this meeting together. And obviously I'd like to, on behalf of the faculty, thank all the participants for all their questions and for uh, spending their, um, their uh, last couple of hours with us. So enjoy your day. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you for the next uh, uh, webinar in about a month's time. Bye now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye everyone. Thank Thanks. Bye everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. Are we off uh, record?
Thanks, Vivek. Bye. Thanks, Thanks for this for the invitation.